Good morning and welcome to St. Andrew's Cathedral in Prince Rupert as we gather from across the diocese and further afield to offer our worship. I am David Lehman and we gather on this November 14th, the 24th Sunday after Pentecost. Our worship today is from the service of the word one. The diocese ministers on and with, with 10 First Nations, including the Haida, Shimshan, Niska, Haisla, Gitsan, Wasetwin, Dakani, Sakani, Cree, and Dunija, along with Metis, a privilege we gratefully acknowledge. We invite you to sing the hymns, pray the prayers, and reflect with us on the readings. Our opening hymn is, O Worship the King. We greet each other with the ancient greeting of the church. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that you have again brought us together on the Lord's day to praise you for your goodness and to ask your blessing. Give us grace to see your hand in the week that has passed and your purpose in the week to come through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, as we turn our hearts and minds to worship Almighty God, let us confess our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, 
to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful God, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We sing our next hymn, All Beautiful, the March of Days. Colleague for this day, together let us pray. O oh God, you gather a people you call your own. Confirm us in the strength of your abiding word, and stay our hearts in the time of trial, so that on the day of the Son of Man we may without fear rejoice to behold his appearing. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The first reading. Elkanah is on his annual pilgrimage to the Temple of Shiloh. He enjoys the sacrificial meal with his two wives, Panina and Hannah, as well as with his children by Panina. He loves Hannah in spite of her barrenness. She can no longer take Panina's taunts. The first reading is written in the first book of Samuel, beginning at the first chapter at the fourth verse. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Panina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. <clears throat> Therefore Hannah wept and could not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant 
and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, that I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The 16th Psalm is appointed for us today. We shall say it responsibly by the whole verse. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, You are my Lord my good above all other. All my delight is upon the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. Their libation of blood I will not offer, nor take the names of their gods upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not fall. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures evermore. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Second Reading The author has told us how much greater is Christ's sacrifice of himself than the annual sacrifices of the high priests on the Day of Atonement. Now he says that what any priest offers in sacrificial ritual is little compared to Christ's once-for-all time sacrifice on the cross. The second reading is written in the letter to the Hebrews, beginning in the 10th chapter at the 11th verse. And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, 
Let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gradual hymn is, Tell Out My Soul. A reading from the Gospels. Jesus teaches his followers how to live free from worry and anxiety. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. And when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. And they will lead many astray. 
And when you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Gospel reading today is from the 13th chapter of Mark. In the previous chapter, Jesus has been challenged repeatedly by the religious elite. And now, at the end of that, he comes to this encounter with the disciples. It is an interesting exchange because they come out and they see the wonderful buildings where Jesus has been challenged in, and they look at them, and they, they marvel. You need to remember at this point that most of the guys that Jesus is traveling with are country hicks, and that, you know, being in Jerusalem, seeing the marvels of the architecture is something. And Jesus then gives them the news that these buildings won't last. And then we go away, and we go apart, and, and Jesus sits with the three, with Peter, James, and John, and they have more questions and they're searching for understanding. And Jesus has this private word with them. And he tells them about the apocalypses, the many apocalypses that are coming. Those that we might be experiencing right now in some ways with a global pandemic. Two years ago, at this time, I had the privilege of being on vacation in England it was the first time I'd gone overseas, and I'm a country bumpkin. I grew up in the Northwest Territories. I've spent most of my life in small rural places, smaller than Prince Rupert, typically, and buildings that are stick builds and not meant to last very long. Uh, recently, I was listening to someone talk about this building being 50 years old. And it was a prominent building in the community, and it had to be knocked down because, well, it was really old. And I thought, what a difference in perspective, having been to England. And one of the things that I was thinking about as I was walking the streets of London was to think about how so many others had walked those streets before me. Think of how those buildings had withstood so much from the Great Fire of London to the Blitz uh, of the Germans in World War II, to countless invasions over the centuries and, and civil wars and strife and riots. And to think that, you know, on some of those roads, Roman centurions had walked once upon a time. To go up to Walsingham, to see the ruins of the once famous shrine and to go to the local parish church that is now the shrine and the place of devotion to uh, our, our Lord's mother. And to stop in and be in a place of profound prayer where people had gathered for centuries. And it makes me appreciate this passage where Jesus is warning that stones will not be left upon stones and that there is a frailty and uncertainty to life and that, that, and yet there's also this long stability at the same time, this oxymoron of, of shortness and temporality and longevity at the same time. And to be like one of those disciples looking at the great temples and the buildings around and, and saying, wow, isn't this marvelous, to also being reminded that it's not meant to last. And that we're always in the midst of little apocalypses, those end of time moments that make us anxious, make us wonder where God is at, make us worry about what life is and have those existential questions. We live in a liminal time, a time in which we do not know where we're going or how we will get there. We do not know when, what new, the new normal will look like. It wasn't that long ago when mask mandates became a permanent thing in British Columbia and having to wear them whenever we're in a public space. 
and there is no end in sight to that, is part of that reality, part of our mini apocalypse that we're in the midst of now. And so, where do we find comfort? Where do we find strength? Do we find it in rebelling against the public health orders and, and the science that is before us? Are we holding out for more science, and maybe better science down the road? I must admit, the vaccines have only been a, in process for the last 16 years, and global usage of an MNRA vaccine has not been needed until this moment. And yeah, there are some uncertainties, but there's always uncertainty in life. Jesus was telling the disciples that today. Jesus was also saying to the disciples, we need to trust in the Lord, and not just trust in the blood of Jesus will save us, because it will. It will save us from our sins. It will save us from our fallen nature. But also, we have to trust God that he has blessed people around us with incredible gifts. For those of research and study, for those uh, of medical uh, treatments, and, and being able to understand things that we could not possibly fathom. I have no idea. Well, I have an idea how things get built. I've seen videos. I've read books. But the actual doing it, no clue. Don't hand me a power tool. Lives could be lost. But to stand there and to see some of those marvelous buildings, to stand in this marvelous building thinking it was built before power tools, before big saws and such, and it was done primarily by hand, is awesome. And to think the love that went into them, the love that went into this building and into all of our places of worship, but more importantly, the love that has gone into our lives by those who've gone before us, those who have shaped and molded our faith and life, those people God has set before us to help us come closer to him. And yeah, these are difficult days. But we also have this wondrous opportunity to come apart, to come away, to hear of God's goodness, to be reminded in prayer of God's love for us, to be strengthened in God's word and sacraments, and then to go out again into the world that desperately needs to hear that, yeah, the world's in a time of transition, our society's in a state of flux, we're needing to rebuild indigenous cultures and communities. We're needing to grasp what it means to be a Canadian and what it means to be a Christian in a postmodern, postcolonial world. These are big questions and they take time. They take effort and they take patience. And what the world keeps telling us is, it's supposed to be instantaneous, it's supposed to be now, it's supposed to happen quickly. And yet, one of the gifts we have as the church, one of the gifts we have as people of faith, is to say, wait on the Lord. We've been waiting for over 2,000 years for Jesus' return. We're going to have to wait a little longer yet, I imagine. But Jesus will come. And all these little mini apocalypses will be swept up into that great return, into that great revelation, into that great moment when we will rejoice and be in Jesus' presence. So I pray that you today will pray for our world, for all those who are conflicted and struggling at this time, that they may know the peace of Christ. We pray for those who are wounded by our society, who are wounded by the church, that they may hear, forgive, hear an apology from the church and from those around them, that they may move to a space of forgiveness. We pray for those who are, are continuing to offer us hope for those in the church and those in the scientific community, those in the medical world who are striving to find ways to move us through this mini apocalypse. And we pray for our world as we await Jesus' coming again, that we wait with anticipation, with preparation, 
and with excitement. For in that day, we will rejoice. Amen. In response to God's word, let us confess our baptismal faith as we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families and friends, neighbors, and for all those who are alone for this community, our country, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth, for David our bishop and for all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in the church, for our own needs and for those of others. We invite you to name aloud those who are in your hearts and minds this day, bringing them before God and knowing that he will hear your prayer. We pray for those who are struggling with the coronavirus, for those who are in hospital, particularly in ICU beds, for those who have been flown out of our health region and to southern hospitals, for their recovery, for their family and friends. We pray for all who are recovering at home, for those whose recovery is longer and complicated, for all awaiting test results and the billions yet awaiting vaccines and for those who are vaccine hesitant, that God's healing hand will be upon all of them and upon all who suffer this day. Praying for those who are awaiting doctor's appointments, diagnoses, surgeries, for all recovering from surgery, for all who are undergoing treatments, therapies, and procedures, for those who are struggling with addictions, for those struggling with mental health issues, especially anxiety and depression, and for all who are walking the dark road of grief. That God's healing hand will guide and direct those who have care for them, will encourage and support them, and give an abundance of compassion to all. We pray for our families, our friends, for our communities, for all who walk in the path of faith. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of life, and we invite you to name your blessings at this time. We give thanks for the blessings of creation, for the harvest that has been this year, for our faith, for our friends, for our family. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for those who have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. We invite you to name those who are on your heart this day. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
Thank you for your continued tithe support of your parish and the diocese. It is most appreciated. Our offertory hymn is Blessed Assurance. Together we pray. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you, and you have promised through your well beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together, you will hear their requests. Fulfill now our desires and petitions, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come eternal life. For you, Father, are good and loving, and we glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, and in the language nearest to our hearts, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today and for gathering from across the diocese and further afield. It is a blessing to have you with us. We continue to gather as, as a diocese to offer our worship Monday through Saturday at 1215 Pacific, 115 Mountain, a service of midday prayer from here at St. Andrew's Cathedral. On uh, 9 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Mountain uh, nightly, you'll find the Dean this week leading us in Compline as I am on holidays. Wherever you are, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit 
be with you this day, indeed, forevermore. Amen. Our closing hymn today is, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Let us go forth watching and waiting. Thanks be to God.